Hello, hey. y'all. Y'all see we started hey. new year off. <laughs> listen, With it's all about us. us. It's all about know, us. Listen, <laughs> listen, it's 2021. <laughs> 2021. It's a new year. And although we starting off the year with uh shenanigans with some, with some uh with some scandal. I'm gonna say it like that with some scandal. Mm. Right. We uh we're we're gonna uh we're gonna we're gonna give y'all a little 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 freedom tonight. Uh I really felt that it was important for us to move forward and and still do the show. Uh, because some of us just need a break away from what's going on. And if you have been living on a rock all day <laughs> in right. America, there right. is an attempted coup currently happening. <laughs> and our, uh, yeah. 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 You post this. So so that, that's that. Hey, Jeff, we miss you. You guys, Jeff will not be with us tonight. Uh, he's he's not feeling well, and he's buried under a mountain of work on top of that. So send him good vibrations and well wishes. Um, you know, that's what happens when you take vacation and come back. And, you know, people miss you, but we miss you so much, and we love you. And uh, so I want to send a word to everybody in D.C. Please, you guys, be safe, be careful. Heed the warnings. You're in Virginia, Maryland, anywhere in the DMV area. Please be careful. If you're in Atlanta, please be careful. Uh, at this point, if you're in the United States of America, if you ain't got to go nowhere, please stay home because this is real. This is really happening. And we just don't know how far reaching this can go. So, but tonight um, we are. Um, we are talking about the impact of absentee fathers on relationships. And I know that, um, you know, there's, you know, you guys know that Horace, I don't know where he is, but I'm texting him now. <laughs> Horace is a huge, huge, huge champion of black love and oh, black love. And, um, you know, I, I really thought that having tonight's conversation really shed some light on how we can really bring that together and do a huge push towards how we can keep the black family unit, like I said, together. And I think it begins wholeheartedly with having these conversations about, um, about what impact fathers the role that fathers play with dating and relationships so you know it's me and piff and we're gonna do what we're gonna do and um <laughs> listen baby, by the show must go on and it will mm -hmm. it will okay um but i really did want to to kick the year off with a bang and i, I really thought about this um during the holidays as far as how we would kick the year off and i thought that this was a great conversation to have because um, as people come up with resolutions and all of these different things, one thing that I would think that would we definitely need, especially after 2020, is a is a hard look at what we can do to improve relationships, especially as it relates to the family unit. And so I just I really wanted to um, kick us off with that. Horace, welcome to the show, boo. <laughs> Unmute yourself, babe. You're, You're muted. muted. I'm mute. You're muted. Thank there you, guys. Thank you for having me. It's a crazy afternoon. I'm just getting in from DC. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's insane. Oh, you're just getting in from DC? Yeah. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah. <sighs> so you let, so you left <sighs> me here. What a day. You what left a day. I, I started to text you earlier to say, are you safe? Because when you are a public figure, people come at you left and right for any reason possible. Yeah. yeah, you are no, uh, in the heart of Trump land. So, yeah, we actually got some stuff. I'll tell you offline that's going on right now at the moment. Yeah, oh, just stuff I warn so, people of, but I don't know what I'm talking did, about. No, usually, did. it didn't no, happen. You did. No, you did. Now I will give you some credit on that. You show, you show yeah. did. You yeah, show did. Yeah, he let us know. I give he, you he credit. Did it. Uh huh. He, did it. he told us last year, and um. He called it. He called it. He called all of this last year. So uh, him and Jeff. So it's, it's just insane. But you guys, we want to welcome you all to the show again. Welcome to 2021. It has started off with scandal. 
uh, of the highest degree. <laughs> The world is watching and now the world is speaking. Uh, so I just, again, I thought that this was a great conversation to have. Um, like I said, before Horace came on, we all know that Horace is a huge champion of black love and black families. If you've been, if you've been with us since we started last year, it's, that's kind of an underlying theme. We all kind of know this by now. If you don't, then figure it out. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm straight up telling you that this is who he is. This is what he thinks. And I really think that you know, one of our goals in this conversation is really, and a lot of our conversation is for you to make an informed decision about relationships, particularly black love. And this is a show for us. It's by us. It's about us. Um, there's enough stuff out there for everybody other than us. So um, what we talk about is things that, that affect the black, black love, black relationships, um, the black community. And um, so without further ado, this topic is important. I thought that it was great to start the year off talking about, you know, the, the role absent fathers have in um, in relationships and how it impacts that. And so I'm going to start with Piff. Um, share with us, you know, when you heard the topic, when I sent the topic, how did you feel about it? What did what did you think? And, and how did it resonate with you in any way? You would, you would start with me. You, you well, it was the time at first, and then I'm gonna go. I'm gonna, trust me, I'm gonna get or sounds up in here. <laughs> um. So, one, I thought, oh wow, this is actually really good. Um, because I always, I've always thought because, especially for our, I would say from the age of like 32, people between the ages of 32 to about 50 are affected by this, right? Absentee fa fathers, or they may be an absentee father, which I'm not telling everyone. I'm just saying they, they could be. Um, right. I think our age, that age group, generation, what is it? Generation X. Yeah, and Gen, Z, X. Yeah. Gen X and Gen Z um, are most affected by this because that's like, after all, like the free love in the seventies and the eighties, like, yeah was going on. And um, anyway, I just think there's a brokenness. Like mm -hmm. one, there's no one to really show somebody how to be there, you know, right. what I mean? as far as male figures, right? This is something that Horace, I listen to your show and I hear the gentleman on your show stating, I didn't have an, I didn't have an example. And then I also look at the women and they're, you know, and I'm not saying men aren't trying to do this also, but I look at women and we're trying to fill a void because our dad wasn't there. And there's this emptiness and this love that we're trying to fulfill, but people don't really understand that your dad is the only one that can fulfill this. Right. Yeah. Um, and so with, I ha on my father's side, I have so many siblings and unfortunately none of us are by the, well, I can't say none of us, only a couple of us are by the same mom. Right. And um, the ones of us that were not raised by my father, we have that emptiness and we, we kind of share similar viewpoints when it comes to how we feel about certain things. Um, but I will say that it mm -hmm. definitely does affect uh, the relationship because if you don't have the model of how things should flow or how you, you need a model, right. you need to model things for you because you, flying blind is just not it. So I, I think right. that generation X and generation Z are, are really broken. Right. So that kind of All like right. my thought, I think they're both aff affected. Um, repeat because I, I really want to make sure I reference my comments. I don't go off off base. Um, oh, he's been so, through it today, right? Yeah, so yeah. we're really talking about just the impact that the impact of absentee fathers on relationships. You know, pretty much. You know what? How how that di how that play how that dynamic plays out. I got to this because last year I not last year. 
no, sorry, 2019. <laughs> in 2019, I did some coaching for Black Enterprise BMX event here. And they, they were down in Miami, 2019, 2018. Anyway, when they, they were here. And I was able to do some coaching for them. And I sat in on the conversation that they had. They had this whole panel about Black fathers and the role Black fathers play in Black men's lives. And I was able to talk to Ed Gordon. He was on that panel. And offline, I asked Mr. Ed Gordon about the impact of fathers on daughters. Uh, because obviously the conversation was focused on being because it's a BMX, Black Men Excel event. And he said, oh, yeah, he said the impact. He said, I have a very close relationship with my daughter. He said on purpose. He said, I'm very at was always active in her life. And she actually travels with him. And he said when he dated, he could always spot a woman whose father was not active in her life. Um, and so this kind of got me to thinking about the impact that absentee fathers has. Um, um, yeah, that absentee fathers have on relationships, you know what I mean? And so I think that that's why I really wanted to have this conversation because this is something that we need to be having universally, you know what I mean? And I don't think we're having enough of them. And so to, to help you, um, shout out to Aisha Paraham. She is a social worker in Georgia and she sent me some information on reasons fathers are absent. And I think if we get into this, we can really, um, we can really, um, we can really kind of hone in our conversation a bit. And one of the things that in her, that the, in the information she sent me on why, why fathers are absent was obviously we know incarceration. Okay, we know incarceration is one of those things and, and, and how that affects it because that came into the conversation. But fathers who are workaholics, because we don't think about this, we automatically assume that the father is just, is from a broken home situation. But a father can, a, it can be a two parent household, but that father works all the time. That can be another reason why he's not in the home. You know what I mean? Another reason is lack of uh, empathy or emotional immaturity, you know, um, is another reason why irresponsible and self-centered. That's another reason why fathers are not engaged. Lack of engagement from their fathers, which teaches them to not engage with their own children. And a lot of that leads to substance abuse, educational problems, behavioral problems, emotional problems, child abuse, criminal activity, poverty, all kinds of things. And then gatekeeping. Gatekeeping by the mother. And we definitely see that whether you're in a two parent home or it's a broken home, meaning divorce, Gatekeeping is another reason why fathers are not engaged in their children's lives or involved. So these are some different dynamics as to why we don't see fathers in the home or in the relationship and in their children's lives. And so I think that um, this is an opportunity for us to look at the different tenets of why fathers are absent and then talk about what we can do to bridge that gap and really keep the family unit together or at least make an effort. And I can tell you right now, that gatekeeping piece, ladies. Yes. You may, If we make the decision as women to have children with these men, you make a conscious decision to lay with someone unprotected, whether you're married or not. Planned parenting mm -hmm. matters. If you make that decision, the child should not suffer because you have an issues with the other parent. Children need their father. That's a choice that you made. Don't be out here gatekeeping, causing division between a father and a children. You know what I mean? And saying stuff like, oh, you just like your daddy and saying negative things to that child about their father, turning them against that father. That child didn't have anything to do with their, their, their creation. You know what I mean? And that's a huge piece, I believe, in what we see it. And it actually came out in that conversation, the BMX uh, conversation that Black fathers had. Some of those very fathers in that room said they dealt with that gatekeeping. They didn't call it gatekeeping, but they dealt with that experience of mothers keeping them, you know, from being actively engaged and having to take women to court, you know, just to be able to be engaged in their children's lives. And so that's the premise of the conversation, Horace, and where we're going and how we want to steer the conversation about tonight. Um, does that help? 
It, well, it does. Um, you know, my scope of this isn't broad. You know, I've had, I kind of see that my gift and my purpose is tied into the trauma that I actually received as a kid, not right. having a dad. Well, having a dad and not having a dad, like most people in my community. Um, my homeboys knew my dad. My dad was like a, a homeboy type. Hey, son, what's up? Give me that and keep moving. Right. He wasn't, you know, he had me young. I think he was 18. No, you think I think he was 20. My mom was 16 or something like that. My dad was a street hustler, actually a pimp. And um, and then, you know, growing up, I suffered abuse. So, you know, I think that's why I have a heart for mentoring young men, because mm -hmm. I am I can understand that uh, people interceded on my behalf for me to be able to be where I'm at right now and to respond because two right. things are going to happen. A lot of men are like me where, you know, we function through and, you know, we carry this trauma around. We carry these issues around and then they come out inside our relationships or friendships or our character. Mm -hmm. And then some of us uh, have enough mentorship or revelation for us to recognize that, hey, we got some traumas. We have some things that are affecting us and work through them because it takes courage to work through those things. Yes, you know, yes. as a child. On the other show, I was telling the guys, like, I was the oldest. So my uncles and everybody was old. <clears throat> so there was a big age gap. So I was, like, the only kid for so long. And the adults in my life, they hadn't really fully matured. So as a kid, I was shy. I was uh, depressed. I was suicidal as a child. Right. As a child. I'm talking about five, six, seven. Wow. And not having anybody to relate to. You know what I mean? Having no wow. one to talk to. Then my... When my siblings came along, I'm still the oldest. Now I got responsibilities because you know how the black family runs. Mm -hmm. Now you're a babysitter and whatnot. So right. you just felt abandoned and you felt rejected and not having a male. You know, you need that blueprint. I need something to try to help me figure out what being a boy or a man is. Right. So I think that, you know, uh, that was big. I was blessed that my best friend's dad was the city manager but he's also my football coach wow. you know back in riviera beach before crack era we still had a community there so yes, it might not be my dad but it was always a few good men that interceded and became dad to a a, a host of other uh young men in our community so i am thankful today uh that i'm able to pour into other young guys and whatnot but yeah. it was tough for me mm -hmm. and uh, I ruined a, a relationship before because the person that I hated the most subconsciously somehow I turned into him Wow! and didn't even know it. I had to, I had to apologize to someone's kid who I dated because I was loving, but I was mean to him, but I kind of mirrored what I went through with my grandfather. My grandfather was a great provider, but he was not a loving person. He was mean. He was tough. Like I didn't give him even, I never hugged him until he was probably age 80, you know, wow. right before he died. And he came from that kind of, like his mother, his own mother didn't want you to hug her. Like some real trauma that we were repeating in my family. Wow. Um, that, and then in my marriage, uh, um, certain things triggered me. I remember my wife had an argument where she said, you're not a real man. Mm -hmm. And I never wow. could forget her. But the interesting part was she had never knew her dad. She had wow. an interesting situation with her dad. So it was like, for you not to have a dad, and I know I'm a man at this point because I know right. I'm being intentional to be right. everything I was. I, I'd never seen for you to say that was kind of like a moment that it it took me a long time to recover. I pretty much had to understand that she didn't know what she was saying because of her trauma to get over right. what she had did. So wow. we have a lot of stuff, man, in our community that – you really do need to pull off the bandage and get courageous to, to face. Right. Wow. That is, wow. <laughs> that's a lot to unpack, but I think that that's the reality. Uh, uh, Reggie, shout out to Reggie. See you, babes. Um, something you said reminded me of a comment that Reginald shared last year. I don't know if it was, it wasn't our last show, but it was no, no. a show in November when he talked about how hard his father was mm -hmm. and because his father was hard because his grandfather was hard. And, and, and this is the comment, the black community, of the past was often, um, that absent parent, but it's more so, I think that 
uh, um, we did a lot of trauma bonding and, and a lot of trauma handed down. And so when you don't know, you can't walk where you haven't been. Um, and so sometimes walking where you haven't been often means walking in the footsteps of, of toxic behavior because you don't know how to undo that. And like you said, Horace, if you don't have people in your community that can raise you, when we used to say it takes a village to raise a child, where we grew up in Revere Beach, again, like you said before the, the crack era, Revere Beach was a village. That that's it. That we were a village. That's it. Um, everybody, everybody. It was just like, okay, if you meet somebody at school, who your people? Everybody knows what that question means. Who your people? If your family got a history of certain type of behavior, you already knew. If they didn't come out with the right family name, you already know you can't play with that person. Mm -hmm. You the word, but not get back that you was playing with that person even at school, because your teacher might live three houses down for you like mine did. Right. <laughs> so it really takes a village to raise a child, and that's what Horace and I grew up in, growing up in Revere Beach. Everybody know the Hughes family. Everybody know Horace family. Like everybody knew each other growing up. You know what I mean? It's just like it was nothing to be taught by the same teachers and come through, and and it was so tight knit. And so we had like Pop Warner football and Pop Warner cheerleader. We actually had Pop Warner cheerleader. I mean, baseball and all of those different T-ball, all of those different things. The coaches played an active role in your life. That coach could, that coach had permission to spank your behind if you acted crazy because it was so tight. It was that tight knit to the point that before there was cell phones, that coach could get word to your mama, your dad, and they know. And it'll just be like, okay, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think that when we have this dynamic of a village coming together, I agree, Lisa, that's what we're missing. We are missing the village in our communities today. But, um, you know, there's so many different dynamics that have contributed to the, to the breakdown of those villages in our communities. But that's what, that's all horse and I know. And I think that part of the challenge, I know part, for me, part of the challenge in dating is wanting, not necessarily that village feel, but de but definitely wanting that family unit where both parents are actively engaged in their children's lives and where there is work-life balance, where there is that, um, that safe space. You know what I mean? Y'all should know that I'm all about safe spaces. But, um, you know, how are we creating those safe spaces so that we can come together as a family again? Uh, because Reginald is making a very good point here. Sometimes you can't trust the village. Um, but I will contend to that is sometimes the village is, is a group of people that you create, not necessarily just the people that live next door to you, but it's who you, who you curate. You know what I mean? Because these days your village can't be your next door neighbor. <laughs> your village, you know, I might have somebody in Atlanta that's part of my village. I got two people in North Carolina right now that's part of my village. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. Go ahead, Horace. No, I was going to say, you said a point. I think you said sometimes you make your own village. Right. Um, growing up on SAF, you know, we people call us gangs, but before gangs got bad, it was just a clique of people. You know what I mean? With the homes right. were all destroyed. You had a bunch of kids raising kids, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it was tough to see, you know, one of your friends' mom walk past you, you know, doped out and whatnot. So, I mean, even when I was on the streets, a lot of those broken homes, it was more like kids helping raise each other. You know what I mean? The right. criminal activity came later, but originally you had a bunch of kids that were just collectively together trying to figure out life, you know, whatnot. Okay. And, and the and the blessing that I can say about the the super friends, like my guys, we really, really raised each other. I mean, the dynamic of us staying so close together, I don't know if anybody else will experience that, but we had real incidents. Like, there are real moments for your kids uh, as teens. They're not going to be – there's going to be some things that as a man or a boy, they're not going to come to mama. You know, they need that cousin to mm -hmm. ask them about some sexual questions or – you know, just puberty. It may be certain things that they go through that that's when they're going to lean on somebody. So that support group or that friend uh, is going to be big because, you know, sometimes even when you do have a dad, you don't have a relationship with that dad because 
Dad is repeating a cycle of how he was raised. In fact, we discussed last week how uh, there was a meme about this guy who was bragging about his wife had never had to pay a bill in their 18 years of marriage and the kids never had to want for nothing. And the ladies were applauding it. And then a week ago, that same family and man is on a Yana's Fix My Life where the where the, one, the wife wants a divorce and the kids say they can't stand him. Wow. You know, because he was never there and mm-hmm. he was abusive. He was like, hey, I'm providing, but he never connected and showed love in the, guess, in the sense that they right. believe he should. So you know, I think that's going to be interesting. So anyone out there, catch up, catch that episode, yeah. you know, but I defended him, not defending his action. I was like, it sounded like he was just respe- repeating a cycle because he was like, this is how my dad was to me. That's it. That's exactly it. I think that, and that's the point. A lot of times I think that, you know, part of, like I said, and what I said is that emotional disconnect when, when they don't, you, you can't walk where you haven't been. If, if, and, and passing down a lot of these toxic behaviors, if you, if you didn't experience any type of connection from your father, when you become a father, how do you know to do that? Unless you go to therapy, and you make an intention to do better. Like you said, Horace, you made an intention to be a man. You know what I mean? You got to do the work. But how many people are 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 doing the work themselves to be that man, that father, to, to reverse that behavior? Um, I, got, I got to go back to something Reggie said last year in that conversation where he said he took those toxic traits. All of that stuff that he he experienced from his father and his grandfather, and he made himself into a better man, into a better person. But how many people can do that? You know what I mean? Like, and I'm sure that that's not that's not an easy thing to do. That that takes work. You know what I mean? Um, Piff, what are your thoughts? Well, there's actually two different points. I think that we as people, I think that women can also be excluded from raising their own children. Because as you know, recently, a lot of women have lost their children in courts. Right. Um, And so I don't want to just sit here and and woman bash. I definitely think that there there are some women that have been locked out of rearing their own children or even having a relationship with their own children. Um, And that being said, I really do believe when we have absent parents, whether it's a mom or a dad, it's it's impactful. Right. Now to go to the village. This is like a this is like a loaded gun, because right. when you when you're trusting of someone with the most precious thing in the world, something that you carry in your body for not ten months, because pregnancy is ten months. I don't know right. why people say nine. It is ten. ten. Months. If you count it, it's actually ten. It, 10 months, but yeah. um, because most most people go to like 30 weeks, it's 10 months. Anyway, right. so you are carrying something in your body for 10 months. You, you know, however you have labor is however you have labor. Then you invest tons of money and this and that. Um, and you, like Reggie says, you drop your child off at wherever. I think that's an issue, right? You don't know who you're dropping your child off with. We're not thinking like, I want to know in my mind where the thought process is of certain things. And it's a, that's what the issue is for me because I know in my own, in my own family dynamic, the certain things that had happened that we wished would not have happened. Right. And you know, it, you you and and then too you can be there as a sibling and still not know after so many years that this happened to your sibling and so your your village you you need to monitor her, who's in your village you need to mm-hmm. know who they are as an individual because you never know if they ever had a tendency to even think about something crazy or in anything you need to be careful who you allow in your children's lives that is another issue you may need a lot of support i i agree being is not easy but you need to make sure that as a parent 
and 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 a parent that invests in your children and loves your children, you're careful who you bring them around and who you allow to give advice to them. Right. Now, um I will I will give you an example. So Horace talks about city girl I think you call it like city girl era or something like that, right? Um, city girl era. Yeah, yeah, the city girl era. So I was watching YouTube the other day. I watch YouTube every night before I go to bed. It's what I do. And so I'm watching YouTube and uh, the King Von, that rapper that was just killed, right? right. He had a little girlfriend, Asian doll or whatever. His nephew was being, his, his nephew was being recorded by his mother. And I think he was three, but he could barely speak clearly. And he was cursing, saying, I don't want to be on YTube. And it was so, it was, the English was just not that great. Right. But, <laughs> or the diction, I should say, was not that great. And um, I don't want to be on YouTube, F YouTube, this and this. And she's laughing. Mm -hmm. This is his mother. So yeah. again, as we... As we watch and we say, okay, I'm watching certain things, right? And I'm uh -huh. like, oh my God, this is not okay. Like, right. I don't know why I wasted my little three minutes of my life on this <laughs> type of shenanigans. But right, reclaiming my time. <laughs> hello, call me Maxine. So here, here's the thing. We're, we're sitting here and we're watching as good people. Mm -hmm. why, my question is, why aren't good people pouring into these other people that they see need a little bit of help. There's, mm -hmm. There is a way to do it. You can wow. easily say, look, um, he shouldn't be on YouTube. Do you hear his speech? Maybe we need it. Like, and it's not, it, sometimes it's not easy conversations, but I think there's, just, it's just a mixed bag of bad. We right. Did we did lose, we did lose the community. We did lose, we lost a lot of stuff because it became, because of the bad stuff that was going on in the village, right? People started cutting people off. Mm -hmm. So now you're not going to talk to my kid and da, 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 da. Okay. Then your kid's in jail for the, the rest of their life because they go and they kill Pop Smoke at 15. Right. Go ahead, Horace. Right. No, um, it's funny you say that. The other day I was at Imperial, so he was a know where that's at on Blue Heron. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting in the car, and, uh, you know, a few people had seen me come up because, you know, I don't visit that area a lot. And I, I hear pop, pop, and I look at my review. I see two kids, probably 15, 16, shooting into the apartments from traffic. And they run by me and others just laughing like it was just the most casual thing. Right. They ran back through the parking lot. And so, you know, when police came through, I'm like, you know, um, but the interest of the point of it is at one time we know they tried to dumb us down. They know the attack on the black family. We know how supremacy acts. We know about indoctrination. But I asked one other day, it's like, did it work so well that now it's just on auto renew? Like mm -hmm. it's right. like we're doing it to ourselves because mm -hmm. we won't won't be accountable. I get in trouble for some of the stuff I say, but you know, it's like right now, I even asked one of my great friends in uh, political office, I said, it's hard because sometimes I, I ask them like, is, is it, is it over? Like, do, is it, are we at a point of where we not, some of us are not be able to be reconditioned because right. the stuff like the ignorance that we recognize is like we bathe in it. You know, it's like we celebrate it. So when I see, to Piff's point, when I tell you I see a lady riding through with her kids and the music that she's blasting is the most disgusting stuff ever, I'm like, what are you expecting to come out of these kids? Or my friends that have lost their sons, it's like, you know what he was doing. Like, mm -hmm. you, he didn't work, <clears throat> you work, you're giving him your car, he's getting tattoos, he's, you know, he, you know he's selling drugs. What do you think is going to come from this? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So for by some the streets, people, you die by the streets. That's the motto. Mm -hmm. But for some and people, the daddy isn't there, but God has blessed you to be able to, to be, you know what I mean, to provide. 
like don't bathe in oh his daddy's in jail or whatnot that that does suck but right. i know a lot of mamas that recognize hey this is the situation but god is allowed i'm by god's grace i'm getting it done and i want better for my kids i love that person the one that's like i want better for my kids but the wow. ones are just like and every family has it the ones that are just repeating cycles because mm -hmm. they don't want to do the work i have little respect for it that's what makes it hard working in the community because some of the people that you're trying to help are your biggest hurdles yeah i think that part of it is um my mom says it says missing parents inattentive parents immature parents need help but they must also want help that's true. and that's what it boils down to you you gotta want the help um and and here's the question she she's asking do missing parents even care how their actions impact their child and i think it goes back to what i said earlier about the information that aisha sent me the social worker in georgia sent me about emotional people uh, parents or fathers who lack empathy and emotional um maturity um, a lot of it has to do with their own trauma experiences that they've had but um, one of the things one of the results is that fathers lacking in emotional maturity are afraid to grow. And when you are afraid to grow, you won't put in the work necessary to do anything different. So what ends up happening? Um, they create toxic relationships or toxic patterns of behavior, and it just compounds and it just continues to create, and it now creates a cycle that now is passed on to that child. And until somebody makes a decision that I want to break this, I don't, this is not what I desire. Um, it just, again, it continues to, to occur. So I think that in having these kinds of conversations, we're, we're opening an opportunity to figure out how to create these safe spaces. And I, and, and Horace, you make a, a point, like when you know that this is what your child is doing, sometimes, you know, it's kind of like, I know it's wrong. I know I'm taking a huge risk, but we need we need what they pulling in. You know what I mean? And it's it's kind of like it's it's a huge risk that that sometimes you know families undertake in thinking that okay we need to my child's life, and that doesn't make any sense to me. But that's what they do. Um, I'm reminded of y'all just. This, I don't know if it was yesterday or day before, but I think it was last night I saw this video on Twitter of Cardi B. She was listening to WAP, but she cut it off mm -hmm. because she didn't want culture to hear. Somebody was saying, well, why make music you don't want your daughter to listen to? And then it was another point where she was saying, I don't make music for children. I make music for adults. It's not my job to police your child. I think that she made a very valid point. It is not her job to police your child. Um, but I think that what we're seeing in her is probably a result of an absent father you know what i mean where people sometimes people just don't have an issue with the stuff that they do um uh, even as a mother it's kind of like you would think that it would shift but it's not i think it points to horse's point about the city girl behavior it's just like we gonna make money and do what we need to do to provide for the lifestyle that we want at any consequence well, let's let's be accountable here in the sense that I tell you, you know, I was I was not I might have a, a, a great value version of Jay-Z for my life. I'm the great value of Jay-Z. I was not a this person. I was a street dude before. The, right. thing that hurt, the thing that made me grieve over the last couple of years is to see guys that don't want to grow up. There's a lot of people we went to school with still, still out like they're 18, still doing the same old things. Hey, you're 40. You've been 40 for a minute. I'm going to need you to stop this behavior. Yeah. Some of y'all just starting to try to rap is like grow up because the thing that bothers me, my dad did a lot of wrong, but he did it to buy a house. He did it for a purpose. Like we, I, you might have, when I got older, I understood. I never saw any of it as compared to the kids now who all kids want to, look all kids look up to their parents and you're allowing your kids to celebrate you for the guy that's selling dope and don't hide that from the kids what is your what are you showing your kids he's he's right. thinking that that's life right. i have no respect right. for those guys or the right. girl when i go to the birthday party i turn around if i go to a birthday party and i see little kids on the ground popping and shaking i'm out i, I can't be yeah. around it we gotta yeah. do better we gotta grow up and you've been I, to one of those parties before, like, no way. Yeah. 
I like what Mario up. said. If you guys are not catching the Black Super Friends, you need two Monday nights at nine o'clock. Um, Mario what? said something real powerful Monday night before I had oh. before I had to log off. He talked about um, being a role model for his son, and he was like, you know, um, it was important. It's important for him to, for him to be the role model. It's important for a, for his son to see how affectionate he is with his with his wife, with his mother, and right. and to see that fire in his eyes to go to work and provide for the family and to do all these things and to be that example for his son. And I think that um, you know, that was a powerful statement coming from a black man, a black father who's saying all these things. And cause you guys were talking about the whole TI thing and somebody um, you all had a, a audience member to write in about, okay, that's all great, but what about this energy? for y'all's sons. Um, and so that sparked that conversation among you guys. And I thought that it was a powerful conversation to hear black men talk about the impact that they have in the lives of their, of their sons and being responsible as fathers. I think that I, I wanna hear from you, Horace, you don't have any son, any daughters, you have sons. Right. Um, and so I wanna hear from you, um, you know, on, you know what your thoughts are on how how you would have been as a father if you had had a daughter and what are some things that you you feel are important that a daughter should experience from her father because um whether you know whether the father is at, for whatever reason that the father may not be actively engaged let's say that we we do we are creating an environment an ideal environment where a father is actively engaged in their children's lives but as a father how would you you know, what are some things that you would impart into your daughter? Well, first off, um, God gives daughters to the players. So. <laughs> Boy, I, you know what? I've heard that before. And I'm, you know what? Go sit down. <laughs> some of y'all be escaping. That is true. Some of y'all be escaping. Uh, that is true. But I will say right. um, for but by, with, with my situation, all I wanted, like most men, believe it or not, I wanted to have that Cosby show uh, dream because, it, it, you know, the Cosby show showed us what a black family looked like or the right. possibilities. It made it look just so warm and it looked so safe. You know what I mean? And most of the shows, whether it was Family Matters or you had a black wife, black husband, you know, daughters and sons. But <clears throat> if I had a daughter, I think one of the first things that I would want her to feel is safe. Making sure my daughter knew that when she's in the presence of a man, she should always feel safe. Right. Um, second, I think I would, because I, I always say that that you can tell kids uh, one thing, but it's you, they're gonna do what they're gonna look at what you do. You can tell them don't do this and that, but they're gonna look at what you do. So it would be important for me to s let my daughter see how I love her, her mother. Mm -hmm. And how I treat other women, because if you grew up in a situation where this young girl sees me calling her mom a bitch or get the f in there, or abusive or just not respectful, she's gonna think that that's okay, and she's gonna right. think that's just how relationships work. So, making sure my daughter knows that around a man that she should feel safe, and her seeing that respect is not optional, and seeing how a man should treat you, whether he's your brother, whether he's your a uh, future husband date or a family member like a man should really give a certain respect to women uh when when you know they're in your presence and right. uh, i think third of all <clears throat> just showing her the work ethic of a man because what you see is what you attribute to your definitions you know what i mean right. so you can be told one thing but you're going to look at what's what the images in your life so right. for me and us, us you hear men all the time say, my dad's get up, go to work. And, and that's going to be us like, okay, that is what a man does. He gets up, he goes to work, comes home. That's a pattern that we right. create into a blueprint. That's what life is. Right. So yeah, dad, yeah. Goes to work, comes home. My granddad was a guy that worked, came home, took a shower, went back out, hung on the corner for all night. And then he would come home. For some reason, we would have family gatherings. He would leave. It was like he was never there, but it went back to the trauma of him wow. growing up. He ran away right. at 12 years old. Wow. And so he didn't know what family was. And it was something about love that just made him just run from it. So right. those would be my things of making the safe and the respect. 
and the work ethic that a man should have. But last of all, something I'm learning now and I never understood the relationship that a man should display as far as religiously in the home. You right. know, most of us are just surviving. So it's later on in life before we start to embrace uh, the God aspect, the aspect where the man should be the spiritual, you know, a spiritual leader in the house. Right. Uh, being able to pray with his kids, pray with his wife and whatnot. I didn't, even though my mom's a bishop, I did not embrace that coming up. And most men don't, you know, right. but I would challenge my daughter to get with a guy who I'm not saying date the um, minister of music or some sugar cookie, but I'm saying a man that does recognize God and can incorporate into their friendship and whatnot. So I think that's what I would right. do. Piff, you have children. What would you desire their fathers to impart in them or the type of relationship that, um, you know, you, you, you desire for them to have with their fathers? Mm, well, I mean, I would say more so my daughter, not my son. My son has a relationship with his father. Um, because my daughter actually comes from Native American or indigenous background, whichever you prefer. Um, there was certain things that were opposed to him because he had a baby from a black woman. <laughs> and that's mm -hmm. not necessarily looked at as positive. Um, so. <laughs> that's a hard dynamic. I just, I mean, first of all, y'all got to really understand that that's a very, yeah. very hard dynamic. Yeah. He, he made a certain decision that he made that I didn't agree with. Like right. I, I allowed him to do what he needed to do because he, he was kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. Right. And his only allowing him to do what he needed to do was giving him some sort of freedom, but it really wasn't any freedom. Right. Um, I honestly, I, I just wish that he would have been able to impart the culture. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Even right. though we don't necessarily agree with certain things from indigenous culture, or that's just not how I was raised. Right. Right. I think that that's, it, it's so important being a historian to to, for people not to lose their heritage. Correct. You no. Know? And so um, that's really what I would want is that he was able to do that and he didn't. Right. Um, yeah. I'm, like, I know that's vague, but that's saying a lot. I, I kind of right. feel like, um, as far as my son, he has a, <laughs> he has a, a a positive relationship with his dad. Um, I wouldn't have, well, I wouldn't necessarily say it's so positive. Um, he's very, my ex is very dictatorial. He, it's his way or no way. And that's just, that's right. what he thinks. Um, and so I, I think that when you're in these, uh, how do I put this? These very strained, um, entanglements is mm -hmm. that's the only the only word i could think of that's it. these yeah. it, it i i'm it, it definitely in an entanglement right. because if i you know there's i have to move a certain way and right. i have to be a certain way and if i'm not a certain way or i say the wrong thing um it could come back at me in in a very negative um way Right. Even though I know in a few weeks I'm about to take a major chance and it is what it is. But I um I just think that, you know, as a parent of a child who is considered full black, right? And then a child who is um not full black and she does not look full black, it, right. it isn't it definitely isn't it's either. biracial. Mm-hmm. Biracial. So, well, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I just think it, it has not been easy. And the dynamic is a very, it's a tangle web that I wove for myself. Right. Um, I think that we all, we had this question at work today 
And it was, it was to the point of, do you think that there is someone that fills the void um, to make you, to make you feel more positive? Right. And so I got to thinking about this question and it kind of goes with kind of tonight's show. I think that even though you missed certain things, I think that certain people are placed mm -hmm. to fill certain voids, but we miss it. We miss what where the void is being filled because we're so focused on that half full of the, the glass being half empty, that we're so focused on that half empty part of our wine glass that we're not really realizing that, hey, I did fill your wine glass up. That's how high it goes, you know? Because, you know, my, listen, my wine bottles only have two glasses in them. Because <laughs> I need my cup filled all the way to the top. To the top. I'm just one of those people. Right. Um, <laughs> there ain't no four glasses in there, it's two. There's two glasses in wine bottles, unless it's one of the extra big ones. Anyway, um, that's just kind of my, my take on things is that right. we we do have someone pouring into us. We just have to focus on where it's coming from. And okay. even though it sometimes we have to learn from the non-example, and Correct. do the exact opposite, we, that's a lesson to be learned as well. Right. You no, know, I, I can relate to your guys' uh, story of growing up. And um, actually, they were gangs. It was not us hanging out. Right. It, it was straight up the Bloods, the Crips, or MS-13. Right. Me coming up, because, you know, I grew up on the other side of the country. So it was it was real out there. Right. And... and um, you like if you associated with anyone too long, you were a part of that gang, according yeah. to the other gang. You you didn't have to be jumped in. You you could be shot. You know you're just right. So I guilty think by association, right? Mm -hmm. Guilty by association. And then you know where I grew up, there wasn't in my high school. We had four thousand kids, but there were only twenty black kids. So we had to be very careful as black kids to not linger too long with this one or not linger too long with that one because again, guilty by association and you were gonna catch double what anyone else was, no matter what, because you were black. And it was right. very obvious. So wow. I don't know. I, I think in the dynamic of being raised by Anybody, like if you have a missing parent at all, right? Um, mm -hmm. I guess I could be considered the missing parent, right? right? I definitely do everything a man does. So if you think, if you think about paying stuff and doing, I do that. As right. a, so, you know, I don't know. I, I there's women out here that do it. So I, I don't want the misconception to be that we're women bashing or whatever. I definitely, <laughs> I definitely wear those shoes every day. Yeah. yeah. I think that we've had a great conversation tonight about just the power of, or the importance of having particularly the black father in the home or at least an active part of, um, children's lives because it does have an effect on relationships as Horace said it you know he saw it manifest in his relationships and his marriage and even now it's, it's just brought him full circle into how he's grown and, and the growth and I think that you know it, it definitely affects us as we're dating a lot of times I don't think we realize either consciously or subconsciously how the effect our our, our fathers have on how we at least as a as a woman how it affects us in dating relationships and, and how we choose it right down to how we choose men because Horace says it every single time on the show and I need us to hear this as women men think differently than women do when it comes to relationships and dating you know what I mean and you know if you don't have that man in your life to explain to you what men what men mean when they say and do certain things, you will be lost. Um, you, you truly will be lost out in these dating streets. And it creates a cycle because when you don't know how to navigate a man's mind, 
when it comes to dating, you'll get played or whatever the case may be. And now you feel in a certain way. And now you got to learn a game and, and figure out your own level of game and all of these different things. That, and then it leads to a lot of compromising decisions that you have. Um, and I think that this is where it's important to, again, create safe spaces where we can have these conversations, but be like people like Horace, be actively engaged in the community and want to give back and, and start raising children who have absent fathers, whether they are incarcerated, whether they are emotionally, you know, disconnected, whether they were workaholics or, you know, whether they're just, just you know, victims of, you know, toxic traits that have been handed down. Um, you know, or because of gatekeeping mothers, whatever reason that that father is not actively engaged in the child's life, there's a trickle down effect. I like this question of why we're not holding sons to standards as well. I don't know if it's that we're not, um, I don't know if it's that we're not holding sons to a standard so much as because some people are, I think that it's just overall, whether, whether, whether it's a son or a daughter, there is an impact to relationships overall because how you how people portray themselves and, and you know how fathers behave towards their children is going to impact how they interact with other human beings, period, point blank, growing up. Whether we're talking right. platonic relationships or or more intimate ones. Go ahead, Horace. No, I was gonna say whether male or female, we have to do a better job of cultivating our seeds. Correct. What you put in is what you get out. Right. So, you don't water it. Right. So now it's we're looking problem. at an era that we're all disgusted with, but it's from what we created a decade ago. You know what right. I mean? We didn't address certain issues, and now we're facing the consequences of those things. So yeah. now that we're in an era where we know better, we should be doing better, we need to kind of cut it off and try to uh, redirect and reconstruct to do something impactful for our future. Because right now, Let's be honest, man. It is some rotten, there's some embarrassing things that we have in our community. I agree. And we are the agents that are really carrying it through. Like, right. Say this, because I, I, I could speak to this last comment where it says mothers and fathers need to stop upholding their sons to the highest degree. So I had an incident, I won't say when it was, but I had an incident where someone took a picture from picture of me. I was not, I was not dressed in an inappropriate way. I had a sweater dress on and mm. I had some long boots. I had some long boots on. So I had this much skin showing between right. like my knee the and dress my and knee. Right. Yeah. The, the black and boot. so they, the, this student sent this picture, not only to my boss, but my boss's oh. boss. And they said, well, you know, with the teacher looking this fine, how can I learn? had a conversation, mom comes in because this person does something wrong with their project and I announce, 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 and he did a completely wrong project. Okay, so to show fairness, I I kind of, gave, I gave the students the option of how this project should be graded because I knew that what I had said in my class and why it should be a zero. The students all said, well, no, because you said X, Y, and Z, this is what makes it fair, right? And so he got upset and he brought his mom in and his mom is going off on me saying, you're unfair. You shouldn't, have, you should have just graded his project. And I said, well, technically I didn't need to grade it. I was trying to give the other students, if they, if they really, the ones that worked hard on the correct project, right? wanted me to grade it because I wasn't going to grade anything. He didn't do the project correctly. It was zero. Right. Um, <laughs> no matter how hard he worked on it. Um, so I was just trying to negate how, take myself out of play. Right. So mom is sitting here and she's telling me all this stuff. And, and so I'm sitting here and said, well, you know, mom, he's invited me out on dates. He's done this. He's done that. And I'm telling her and she, says, I can't believe I'm up here because you're hitting on your teacher. But instead of her just stopping there and dealing with just her son, she turns to me and says, well, I don't like how you did X, Y, and Z. And she proceeds to try to go in on me. And I had to really sit there and think about and process 
the whole the whole uh, incident. Right. And I really had to say, yes, yeah, she does have a right to fight for her child and what she thinks is right because he did work. Um, but at, at the same time, when do we hold our own child accountable? accountable. A whole slew of actions, not one project, but a slew of repeated infractions. Right. From one student from one kid. And so that's where, you know, her upholding her son, this is her only son and this and that. Mm. It was a big deal for her. I still did not grade his project. He got, he received a zero, but this is the kind of behavior that people are dealing with and mm -hmm. they don't want to deal with it. I mean, right. even though I did stop and I did say, you know, X, Y, or Z, whether she chose to listen to it or not, you can only plant a seed sometimes. You just have to wait for someone else to water it. I agree. And, and and it's true. What Lisa's saying here as parents, it is our responsibility to teach our children standards, morals, and values. Uh, I think that it just, at the end of the day, you can do everything that you can, um, but people have to want to receive it. You know what I mean? It, it, we, we talked about it. You got to plant the seed, water it, but sometimes you're not the person who waters it. Somebody else has to come along and water it. But at some point, we got to make sure that it's going to spring forth some type of harvest. And eventually, we're going to see what was inside that seed at some point is going to manifest, it's going to come out. Um, <clears throat> and I think that I, I want to end this conversation with this question. What do we do or how do we welcome fathers back into our children's lives who have been absent, who make a U-turn um, and decide to be actively engaged? And I, and, and I, I caveat this with, I know that there may be some red flags and some concerns that people may have that, oh, where's he been or whatever the case may be. I think that if we're going to champion black fathers being in their children's lives, regardless of when or whatever their quote motives that you think they have is, yes, be protective, but don't stand in the way and be a gatekeeper because you've probably been a gatekeeper the whole time. But at what point do we stop and say, okay, how do we help Mm, transition this father back into the child's life um, in some capacity, even if it's on, you know, uh, what do they call it? supervised visits or, you know, maybe he cuts back his work. After 2020, the workaholic father probably ain't a workaholic father no more. You know what I mean? Because they're, they're, it's, it's just people are, uh, 2020 forced people to deal with themselves whether they wanted to or not. Mm -hmm. So whether it's the workaholic father or the um, selfish father, immature, emotional, disconnect, no empathy, um, you know, incarcerated father, he gets out. It's, that's a different situation. We still need to create a safe space for them, but there, there definitely needs to be some rehabilitation all the way around. How do we create these safe spaces to transition these fathers in a way that they're actively engaged in their children's lives in some capacity. Um, Horace, what do you think about that? Um, because I've experienced this, um, I would say to the mothers, protect your kid always, but mm -hmm. remove your judgment and bias from Amen. your decisions. Amen. Remove your decisions. Those personal feelings are going to affect how you see them. So, you know, I can honestly say there may be a situation where the dad can't financially support and be responsible like he should. That right. child is at a point where he doesn't understand that yet. Right. So if, whether it's a recital, a football game, basketball game, that child, that presence of that child, that memory of the dad being there mm -hmm. is one of those things that will be more, it's priceless. Mm -hmm. It's more yeah. valuable to the development of the child. Um, so I ask mothers, I understand it's tough for some of you, but, you know, if God has given you the grace and, and God has given you the ability to provide for that kid, I commend you for that. Uh, but also have a little grace to see that that child needs that dad and let that child come to a point where they make a decision about that relationship with their kids. Because uh, when I was growing up, I looked for that support. You know I mean? I think I, I, I gave up my career in sports because I never really got that support that I wanted, you know, right. or got.
But I say to the parents, I wanted my dad to just be there. And they wasn't. My mom and dad, neither, neither was there. But that was something that I had to, I had to, on my own, tackle right. that issue. And and, it, and for years, I ended up with a, a disgust and a hate for my dad. But at some, wow. time, at some point, I had to reconcile with my dad because I needed to get to know him to understand me. Right. That's powerful. Something you said reminded me of a scene in, in Love and Basketball when she 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 had a confrontation. That's what it is with her mother. It was towards the end of the, the movie. And mm-hmm. she talked about all the basketball games she played in. And she said out of all of them, she could only remember her mom being at two. Mm-hmm. And, and her mom said, you know, it never mattered. Your daddy and your sister was there. She said, it mattered, mama. It did. It mattered. Whether it's a daughter or a son, whether it's a father or a mother, it matters how active you are in your child's life. Like you said, at games, it matters. And we sometimes think children don't get, children do. Children are little adults. They're little human beings with feel, with real feelings. And a lot of them are very, very opposite very observant. And in her whole child, from childhood to college to pro ball, she said, I only, from college to high school, at least, I mean, excuse me, from, yeah, up through college, from, from whenever she started playing up through um, high school, look how she said, I only remember you at two games, two. And it matters. She wanted her mama there. Children want their parents actively engaged in their lives. They really do. And I think that you know, this is what we need to pay attention to, how these things affect our children, how it has a trickle down effect. And again, it don't it affects them as children. Guess what? These children are going to grow up to be adults who do the same thing or make a decision to do the opposite. And when they do the opposite, they tend to go to the extreme. And so I think that we, we got to understand that presence in our children's lives matter, like Lisa said. Go ahead, Horace. I was going to say one of them, we love the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. One yeah. of the most memorable episodes was Ooh, episode when he's five, 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 five. He said, Alpha Phil, why does my dad not want me or something? Oh, my God, that one. Right, bad. because it still triggers me. Yes. Baby, that too. I, I be crying every time I see that one. Well, talking I, about it has been triggered. Um, yeah. because my dad, take your time, baby, take your time. You never really get over it. So with my dad, I looked for validation and affirmations from my dad. And even though my dad, I got to a point where I said I didn't want him and I didn't care subconsciously, I still did things to get his approval. Yeah. And a lot of men go through that. So wow. me playing football was to get that validation. So my dad died. And so I think that's why I'm so intentional with my right. kids. Like I, I, I walked away from my dreams to make sure my kids never felt the void that I had in my right. life. So it is something that I, I commend all my dudes to be courageous enough, man. If you really love your kids, yeah. Face those traumas, man. And if you love them, you'll die for them and do what it takes for they they don't have to go through what we went through. Amen. I don't I don't even know what else to say. I think that um yeah. It's it's very powerful. And I, I will say that as a daughter, um growing up as a daddy's kid in Rivera, all you would see would be Kool-Aid and look Kool-Aid. Like that is who you would see where my dad went is where I went, you know? And so there, when there was a a long stretch where there was just a, such a huge disconnect between me and my dad, you know, my aunt would say, I just don't understand what happened with y'all. And I was just like, I don't have words for it because I was a kid and I still, as an adult, don't understand, you know, don't understand it. And I, and I choose not to dwell on it. Rather I revel in the reconciliation that we're in right now, you know? But did it take a long time to get here? Yeah. I can remember times when I talked to my dad twice a year, his birthday and Christmas. I kid you not. Then it got better to we talked quarterly. That was like, okay. And my sister would be like, I'm not, 
I'm not engaging. I, I don't like I'm not. Um, and so I got to the point where I, I chose a different approach. But in that process, I have my pops. You know what I mean? And we had our, our moments where we clashed, but at the same time, I wish somebody would say something to my pops. I wish you would come near him. Like I like, I wish you would. Like it's 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 gonna be a difference. It's gonna be some furniture moving. And that's how I feel about both of them. Um, but did we get here overnight? No, it's a journey and it's a choice to actively be engaged in your children's lives. Um as a as 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 a girl, as you know. It's very difficult navigating the dating scene. And I am grateful that I went to Tuskegee and I have a host of brothers who I can lean on and I can say, tell me what it means when a guy does this. You know what I mean? Like I can pick up the phone to this day and call them and be like, okay, this is what's going on. What does this mean? You know what I mean? To help me. But a lot of people, some people don't have that relationship with any male figures that can help them to, to game or bridge that gap to where there's an understanding for you as a woman. And so for me as a woman, you know, when I have children, if I have a daughter or a son, I really want my kids to have a relationship with their father. I want him to be actively engaged and, and impart that wisdom. And like you said, Horace, um, you know, be that leader in the home that I didn't have. Like, that's just, I think that's why I refuse to compromise a lot with dudes that show up in my DM being disrespectful because I didn't grow up with that. I wasn't raised with that. I have a grandfather who Eugene Haygood had a standard and he carried himself in a way and I look for that. And there's a way that you approach a woman and you communicate with her. And so I still carry a lot of those standards and expectations because it's important. I don't want to get divorced. When I do this, it's one time and that's it. You know what I mean? I want what my parents didn't have. And that's hard to find. But at the same time, I look at some of my friends who are going through hell and high water because they wanted what they wanted. Now you got what you got and you literally suffering. It's like, okay, I'm glad that I waited. I'm, I'm glad that I didn't get caught up in that. But I, I can say that this conversation is very close to home for me because I did not necessarily have that. I had I had two things. I had, my, my parents were divorced, but my stepdad worked all the time. Um, you know, he was emotionally, when I say emotionally, I think that he lacked empathy in some ways because he didn't have that himself. You know what I'm saying? And so when you talk about, um, you know, trauma passed down horse and generational things, he came from a totally different era. You know, it was just like, man, come home, you bring the money home, you go do what you want to do. You know what I mean? Kind of like your grandfather. And I think that, you know, they did the best that they can. Now, right now, my pops would be like, well, move heaven and earth for his kids and grandkids and great grands. That's how it is. My dad is the same way. But I think that it took some time for them to grow to that point. And I, I desire that for my myself. And, you know, and, and I think that I don't think men understand the power of their presence in their daughter's lives. I'm not a I'm not a boy. So I don't know what it is. I've seen how my uncles treat my net, my cousin, my male cousins in comparison to my female cousin, to their daughters. And it's kind of like, but you do know you got a daughter, right? And it's just kind of like, you do know you got a daughter, right? And it's just an amazing conversation. Um, and that's why I appreciate Corby's com uh, comment about the standards and how it's different for sons than it is for daughters. But unfortunately, it is what it is. It is what it is. So, um, Piffy. Anything? She's just up there smiling and whatnot. <laughs> Well, I, you know what? I um, I guess because of how I was raised, right? And my mom never said you don't have to cry, but I'm going to hold it back as long as I possibly can because I, for me, like I feel like it's really okay for everyone else to cry but me. So if I cry, it, it, it hurt me deep. Like, And so y'all almost got me. Y'all almost got me. <laughs> But I, listen, I'm too gangster for that. And yeah, 
Um, but no, uh, you know, I what you guys both said really resonates with me. Um, I didn't actually meet my dad until I was 30. Wow. And um, it wasn't a good meeting. Like you can ask my sister, my youngest sisters, like they were offended because I was, I had, I had so much. I had 30 years of stuff. Right, right. And when I was eight, my dad called me and said, hey, I'm going to send for you. You're going to come to Florida, you know, whatever, whatever. I think he called me one more time and there was like some issues with my mom and his wife or whatever. And needless to say, I had to actually like pay to find my father and he is still living. But in all of my conversations with one of my brothers about my father, I had to really look I had to look at my life and I had to look and be thankful for what God gave me. And God gave me an amazing mother. Um, No, she wasn't perfect. And yes, I have my issues with certain things, but she put me in a position that none of my other siblings from my father's side have been able to obtain. And um, just educationally, I'm not saying that they're dumb. They're definitely not dumb. And one of my sisters um, is very book smart. She just doesn't have a degree. But I, I, I and I really appreciate her because we can call and when I talk to her, I could talk to her for hours. But I really believe that my relationship with him, which is non-existent because I feel like the hurt is too much Right. Um, it, it's just it's just too it's too much it's too much to go in there and try to dig dig everything out and deal with the grave and so I just leave it alone. Right. Right. I, I have to leave it alone. I have to let sleeping dogs lie because that's how I have to to deal with life and that that I have to be okay with. Um, right. that doesn't mean that I don't love the existence of me being me and me being here. Right. Um, I think that we all in some way, shape or form have some type of parental issue, right? Mm -hmm. Because our parents are human and they're not perfect. But what I will say is there is somebody that fills that void. Look for them. They are there. Or if you don't have anyone filling that void, learn from the non-example. Learn from what you don't want to do, what you don't want to repeat. And like you guys were both saying, there are certain things that I did not want to repeat in my own life, but they did. And so now I really have to, 2021 is the year of reckoning for me. So I am going to step out on faith. And I'm going to pray and I'm going to do what I need to do in order to get what I want to get. And so, um, you know, as far as my parents, you know, my mom's gone. We all know that. But and my dad is still here. But I do have a stepdad. Right. Um, who does call and he checks on me. And so th- it's those type of things that I, ha- I have to look to and focus on and look for the positive and not the negative and cultivate that relationship that I do have with somebody who is not my biological father. So I I definitely can empathize. And yes, y'all almost had me, but y'all is not finna make me cry tonight. No, no, no. (laughs) I I say, listen, that was not what I tended to do because I know I'll get teased for it later, but I've allowed myself to be more transparent and naked because I want my dudes like I want other people to kind of take take from our pain, you know, like take from what we're saying mm-hmm. and um, you know, kind of heal, evolve, grow. Right. So, with me being transparent can help another another black man, another man. Period, man. Uh, you know, I'm all for it. So I apologize for that moment. But I didn't even know I still had that trigger. 
Amen. Listen, we all sometimes we don't we don't know until we start having these kinds of conversations. And, you know, I want to thank you for your vulnerability and your transparency tonight. You shared so much that added a lot to our conversation. Jeff, we miss you, Troy. We miss you. But this was a fantastic conversation all in all. You guys, I really want you to have your own watch parties. Um, you know, have your own watch parties, have your own conversations about this and figure out what your triggers are. You know, it's, it, it's you know, when it comes down to stuff like this, it really is, what's your trigger? And how are you going to address those triggers? It's important that we really start bridging this gap and keeping, um, creating safe spaces where, you know, especially black fathers can be actively engaged in their children's lives um, to the best of their abilities in the safest way possible. Like Horace said, protect your children, mothers, but don't don't be a gatekeeper. Don't do don't do whatever you can to keep that father, that child away from their father. That's that's not good either. Um, you know, again, you made that decision, you know, then find a way to co-parent. Um, you know, 2020 taught us about valuing life, if nothing else. But those workaholic fathers, again, there are different reasons why fathers are not on, in the home. Uh, incarceration is one option, absolutely. But it's also, we learned tonight that it's also, you know, they're selfish. You know, it is what it is. It could be emotional instability and, and, and different things like that. It's also working too much and the gatekeeping mothers. So there are a lot of different dynamics that are that play into why fathers are not in the home, but when they are in children's lives, but when they are there and they have the opportunity, we need to do everything we can to create a safe space where we can cultivate families um, as a black family, as a black community and figure out how to create your own villages because some of these people are working, maybe that father is working extra hard because obviously, I mean, people are in financial situations now, look at what we went through in 2020. There's a lot of different reasons, but create your village, whatever that looks like. Your village may not be your next door neighbor. It might be somebody cross country, but create that village that you want, not somebody that you made in so met in social media land, but somebody that you genuinely know has your best interest at heart and that of your family and want to see them grow and be the best version of themselves possible. It might be a community figure. It might be a political figure like Horace Towns. It could be anybody but you do the research, dig into these people like you would a daycare center. You're not just going to trust your child to any daycare center. Do the same thing when you create your village. So we want to thank you all so much for tuning in to our first episode, to our first show of 2021. We got a good one coming up in two weeks. I'm having a special conversation. I was going to start this in December, but I decided to start this in January. We had some scheduling conflicts and we finally got it together. This single and save this Friday, we're talking about emotional trauma. So you guys, please, 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 if you can tune in right back here, 7 p.m. Friday night, we're going to talk about emotional trauma, um, single and save people, how we can bridge the gap between church leaders and single people. Um, but we can't we just be leaving people to their own devices to figure out how to live life and then be talking about why they do that. Because <laughs> the church is not a safe space for single people anymore. I mean, it is what it is. And not just single people, but definitely it hasn't been a safe space for a long time. And so hopefully this conversation will start bridging that gap so that the church can create a safe space where people can feel like they can come and get the support and love that they need. Want well, to thank you all so much for tuning in to us tonight. Have a fantastic week and we'll see y'all on the next show.